You know, there's been a lot of conversation in the media over the last couple of months about a very troubling report that was released by the CDC back in February. And this report that came out said that, um, shocking, 57% of teenage girls feel persistently sad and hopeless, according to this study. That is more than double the rate of teenage boys. That is an increase of almost 60% over the past decade. And it corresponds with an equally worrisome trend of suicidal ideation among this particular group. According to this study, a third of teenage girls considered suicide in 2021. I mean, just think about that, a third considered suicide. Again, it doesn't mean that they pursued it, but at least gave some consideration to it. You know, it's obviously a very complicated disease that we're dealing with, and the mental health of, of, of our young people is certainly, uh, is certainly concerning. But I think that it's more than just, we can't, we gotta, there's more to it than just one cause. And, but I do think that one of the primary things that fuels this mental health crisis is the world that's been unlocked by social media. Again, this is not an attempt today to, to poor mouth social media and, you know, everybody throw their phones away and those sort of things, but it is something at least to have a conversation about. Writing for World News Opinions, Allie Beth Stuckey, a conservative commentator, reflected on this report. She said, today the virtual reality world brings with it a barrage of filtered photos of people with seemingly perfect figures, ostensibly perfect lives. It is awash with sexually explicit content available even to those who don't actively search for it, as well as predators who, who routinely pressure young girls to objectify themselves for money and likes. All of this in addition to the deepening normal teenage wounds left by rejection and feelings of inadequacy. Instead of learning they weren't invited to a party last weekend, they're watching the party happen in real time. And instead of being able to escape the class bully when they leave school, they're bombarded by her spiteful messages and comments all day and night. And then there's the political pressure that people like me who graduated from high school in 2010 simply did not face. She said, modern teens have the world and all of its problems at their fingertips, and they're told that they need to take a stance on each of them. It's no wonder that so many young people are depressed. They've been robbed of the simplicity of youth that many generations prior got to enjoy. I want to show you a clip from a 2022 BBC documentary called The Instagram Effect. Parents... It would not be bad for you to watch this. You can find it on YouTube before you give your sons and daughters access to social media. You guys turn your attention to this uh, clip from this, uh, the Instagram effect. My name is Lauren Black.
you catch what she said there at the end? Every day I had thousands more people to please. Make a note there. Make a mental note there. Um, every day I had thousands of more people to please. You know, it's tempting for us to think that these are new problems brought about by new technologies, but the reality is these are just remixes of age-old issues. King Solomon told us in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9, what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. The challenge that we're facing here today and the issues that are raised in the media and in documentaries like that, those challenges are directly tied to the idolatry of the self and the attempts to be what the Bible calls a people pleaser. This morning, I want us to turn our attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 as we work towards answering these questions that continue to plague us today. What are we seeking and who are we seeking to please? If you've got your Bibles open, go ahead and open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. If you're able, would you stand with me as I read these uh, verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you is not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we've been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Father, I thank you for the Apostle Paul. I thank you, God, for the clarity with which he speaks. I thank you, God, for the challenge here of, of who we're seeking to please. God, may we always be pleasers of God and not pleasers of man. Bless the time in your word today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, you can be seated. As we move into chapter two of this letter, we get into what I talked about before, the one-sided nature of the letter. We talked about this when we first started. There's a conversation that's taking place. And much like today, if you hear somebody talking on the phone, you don't necessarily hear what is going on on the other side. This is the nature of this conversation. We're only getting one side. But when you read this, you, you can't help but, but recognize that the Apostle Paul sounds a, a little bit on the defensive side. It, it sounds like he's, he's trying to defend himself. And you have to ask the question, where in the world is, is that coming from? And I don't know if you remember seeing in the old Western movies or TV programs the idea of a snake oil salesman. The snake oil salesman would roll into town and he would set up and he'd offer some sort of miracle cure or tonic. And of course it was all just a, it was all just a fraud, but people didn't have Google to be able to fact check the medicine man. And so the man would come in and make a dramatic sales pitch and the goal was to take as much money as he could and get out of town before the tonic at best didn't work or at worst made people sick. You had something very similar to that happening in the Roman days. And it wasn't necessarily somebody peddling a false cure or somebody peddling some sort of, of, of false tonic, but somebody peddling a false idea. These cities in Rome, like Thessalonica, were, were full of traveling philosophers and magicians and religious enthusiasts, and, and they gained their livelihood from, from public speaking and, and public teaching. These, these teachers were, were known with, for their greed and immorality. They amassed wealth and notoriety through their ability to carry on a, a smooth conversation and make a smooth pitch. And their teaching could shift based on the audience and what the audience desired. Oftentimes, they behaved reprehensibly towards outsiders or, or, or towards other people, mocking their opponents, winning over the weak-minded, engaging in, in immoral relationships with their followers, and sponging money off the rich. And so all the missionaries that would come into these towns had to be very mindful of the fact that there were people who made their living doing sort of what the missionaries were doing, which is one of the reasons that you see Paul and other apostles defending the character of their ministry because they weren't like those other characters. And so in the opening verses here of chapter 2, Paul reminds the church about the nature of his ministry. Again, go back and read chapters uh, 16 and 17 in the book of Acts to get the full picture. But it's clear that Paul is wanting the church to remember where they came from. 
the, the experience that, that they endured. And the big takeaway in these first couple of verses is simply this. The fact that Paul and his companions were willing to suffer for the sake of this ministry is a clear indicator of the validity of their ministry. If they were just looking to roll into town to make a quick buck off the wealthy folks in town, then they sure wouldn't endure hardships. They, they wouldn't be willing to go through the trials because really they were just in it for illicit gain. But Paul and his companions, they were willing to go through hardships. They were willing to go through suffering. They were willing to go through trials because they weren't doing this for their own physical well-being. They were doing this because there was a call of God upon their lives to be passionate preachers of the gospel. There's a different motivation in play with Paul and his companions. And it is that different motivation that I want to zero in on for the rest of our time this morning because I think that that different motivation really gets to the heart of some of our current cultural problems as well as our responsibility to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we engage in this conversation, the first thing we want to understand is this. Christians must be distinct from the fallen culture. Remember what I said about those snake oil teachers of the Roman world. This was normal. This was just a regular part of the culture. You didn't have movies to go to. You didn't have those sort of things to entertain. And so you went to the, the town square to hear whatever rhetoric was being spoken or whatever person was there to entertain. This was a regular part of their experience. But there is a clear distinction that is being emphasized here. Paul says, our appeal doesn't spring from error or impunity or dishonesty. We're nothing like those other folks. What appeal is he talking about? This is the appeal to the gospel. And the good news about Jesus, it's not anything about impunity or dishonesty. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the most profound truth that you can hear today, and we have to take that truth with utmost seriousness because the gospel says something about all of us. Every single person who, who hears the gospel, it makes a declaration about all of us that we are all sinners and we completely fail to live up to God's standard of perfection. That is for everybody. And if any preacher doesn't include himself in that group, then that preacher's not preaching the truth. Every single one of us comes up short of God's perfect standards of righteousness and holiness. None of us can get there on our own. That is the gospel. And because of our sin, God has no choice but to judge us for our crimes against him. We are sinners by nature and we are sinners by choice and we stand rightly condemned by a holy God because of our terrible imperfections and our terrible sin that completely fall short of God's standards. But the good news is this, God sent his son not just to live a model life of perfection that none of us can live, but he sent his son to pay the penalty for our crimes. This is the good news. Through his death, he pays our penalty, but he didn't stay dead. He came back to life so that he could guarantee eternal life to everyone who would follow him. This is the good news. It is not based in impunity or error or falsehood. This is the most truth you can hear today is who Jesus is and what he has done on your behalf. By receiving this gift that's been offered to us, we are then set on a new pathway. We are not removed from the world. The Bible says that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are to be distinct from the world, and our minds can no longer be conformed to the things of this world. There is a distinction between those who follow Jesus and those who do not. And Christians must be distinct from a fallen culture, even if we must still dwell within it. But secondly, as we, we work our way through these verses, we need to understand that our motivation in life to be distinct is not about pleasing people. It's not about pleasing people. One of the sins that we have the greatest propensity toward is perhaps one that we recognize to be the least consequential. You know, we make our sin list. Everybody's got a sin list. You may not publicly declare that you've got a sin list, but everybody's got a sin list. In your mind, you rank things. You rank your sin list. If somebody says, oh, I'm a murderer, you judge that person differently than someone who comes up and says, oh, I'm a shoplifter. 
And the ranking comes about because of the consequential nature of those sins. And so you say someone who's a murderer is far worse than someone who's a petty shoplifter. Even though both are are hostile, they're sinful against God. So we make these sin lists and we rank them in order of how we deem their consequences. And so sins against other people, we tend to put those higher on our list. But those sins that don't have an immediate impact on other people, what do we do? Well, those kind of get bumped to the bottom. We've got those overt public sins that, that we won't tolerate, but when we start talking about our private sins that, that nobody knows about, well, those aren't nearly as serious because nobody else is affected by those sins that, that are just on the inside of our own hearts. But what we're talking about today is actually a sin that may not have even made it on your list, but the Bible speaks clearly against it. And there's this sin that the Bible speaks so clearly about is being a people pleaser. You heard that Instagram influencer. I I hate that we have that as a job title now. You heard that influencer in the video talking about that she now had the need to please all of these thousands of new followers. Man, I struggle with that too, with all my thousands of followers on social media and trying to make them all happy. She's being a, a people pleaser. And now understand this, when I talk about being a people pleaser, I'm not talking about doing nice things for other people. This is not at all what I'm talking about. If I bring my wife flowers, I'm not trying to be a a people pleaser. I'm trying to be a good husband, and that's something very different. If I pull her over on the side of the road to help somebody who's broken down, that's loving my neighbor, not being a people pleaser. Those are, we're talking about something different here. The sin of people pleasing is when we find ourselves living for the praise and approval of others. Let me say it again. The sin of people pleasing is when we live for the praise and approval of others. Again, you may say that didn't even make my list, but this is one of these, this is one of these sins that the Bible's very, very clear about. Because the problem with being a people pleaser is that being a people pleaser may lead to what we would even consider to be good outcomes. What do you mean? I mean, we easily see this in children, children who've yet to profess faith in Christ, who aren't motivated by love for God per se. Instead, when a child desires to please her parents, why does a child desire to please her parents? Because she believes that that doing so will result in praise or affirmation. And so the child who's doing what's right because they know they're going to receive some sort of praise and affirmation, that is being a people pleaser that we see very early on in children. Part of us discipling our children, though, is helping them realize and recognize that obeying parents is not about pleasing parents, but it's about pleasing God. God is pleased when we obey our parents. That's the fifth commandment. It's the only one with a promise. God is pleased when we honor our father and mother. God is pleased when we do those things. If we don't help our kids realize that when by obeying parents, they're actually obeying God, what we're ultimately doing is setting them up for failure. Because what happens, what happens when that child is no longer in a position to be a pleaser of their parents? The same is true for the church. Good behavior is not about making the youth pastor happy. I mean, I know Pastor Jacob is delighted when he sees good things from our students, but those students shouldn't be doing good things because Pastor Jacob's going to give them a high five and say, good job. It's not about receiving the praise and adoration of other people. Our musicians do a phenomenal job leading in worship, but they don't lead in worship so that you all will praise them and, 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 and thank them for what they do. That's not why they do that. We don't sing on the worship team because the positive feedback we get from the congregation. We don't volunteer in the nursery so that other people will see our willingness to serve and pat us on the backs. And the problem is it's so easy to fall into this trap. We unconsciously run a moral equation in our minds. If I do this, whatever this is, then I receive feedback that feels really good. And we run this equation in our mind over and over and over again. What happens, though, when we encounter someone with different expectations? 
a child pleasing his parents because the parent has spelled out clearly defined expectations. You do these things. You have this curfew. You have this behavior. If you do these things, you will be rewarded. We will be pleased with you. We will be happy with you. What happens when that child encounters somebody that they respect with different expectations? What about a boyfriend with sinister motives? What about when they are no longer a child and they encounter an employer that wants them to compromise ethics or safety? If I just do this, my employer will be pleased with me. If I just do this, then my boyfriend and girlfriend will be pleased with me. And suddenly, we're no longer under the authority of a parental figure. We're suddenly trying to work this out in other environments. Or what happens when they go to social media and there are hundreds and thousands of people that are watching them. The young lady that posts one kind of selfie only gets a few likes. But if she posts a different kind of selfie, that maybe one that shows more skin, she finds that it gets a whole lot more likes and a whole lot more comments. And suddenly we see this behavior that's being reinforced by that positive affirmation from people who don't have their best interest in mind. And this sin of people pleasing starts going down a very, very dark pathway. And some might say, oh, Pastor, that's an overreaction. But I would say that it's exactly the kind of reaction that the Bible calls for. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. It's on the screen. It says, for am I now seeking the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to, to please man? If I were still trying to please man... I would not be a servant of Christ. Do you hear what Paul's saying there? He's saying you can't be a people pleaser and a God pleaser at the same time. Those two pathways don't line up with one another. Those are strong words. You can't be a people pleaser and a God pleaser at the same time. Well, why is that? Because they're coming from two different motivations. There are two different drives, two different people. One a people pleaser, one a God pleaser could approach the same problem with the same solution, reach similar outcomes. But the one involved in the sin of people pleasing was in sin the entire time. Look at John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many of the authorities, it's one of these heartbreaking passages, many of the authorities believed in him, believed in Jesus, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so they would not be put out of the synagogues. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. The sin of people-pleasing will keep people out of heaven. The sin of people-pleasing will keep people out of heaven. The people, John pointed out here, they believed what they saw. They believed what they heard. They believed what Jesus was teaching. They believed all of the facts that they could find about Jesus, but they were unwilling to confess their faith in Jesus because of the consequences of following Jesus. These people missed the kingdom of God because of the fear of man. There are some folks who are hearing this today, and you think back to when you were a kid, you walked an aisle, you prayed a prayer, even got baptized, but you did so out of a desire to make someone else happy. You did so because a parent or a grandparent, you knew it would please them. You did so because a Sunday school teacher or a youth pastor, you knew it would please them. But you need to ask a very serious question this morning. And it's a question only you can answer. I can't answer it for you. As you look at your life today, did you really put your faith in Jesus or was your faith in the one you were trying to please? There are so many people today, their faith has come off the rails as they've gotten into adulthood and say, how'd that person come unglued? What happened in their faith journey? And so many times the reason they came unglued is because when they gave their life to Christ, they weren't really giving their life to Christ. They were giving their life to Christ on behalf of pleasing somebody else. And there was never ever any saving faith in their life. How you answer that question has eternal consequences. So what should our motivation be? Our primary motivation for our actions should be a desire to please 
God. Go back to 1 Thessalonians. There's a clear contrast here between pleasing people and pleasing God. The gospel Paul preached would have looked very differently had they been about had, had that gospel been or had his motivation been about pleasing people. It's hard to face a mob as a people pleaser. It's almost like a politician. What can, a, what can I say that will get the most number of these people on my side? Well, I can assure you that the, the most effective way to not get people on your side is to look to a group of unchristians and say, you're all sinners and you're going to hell apart from Jesus Christ. That is not the first chapter in how to win, win friends and influence people. That is not the first thing that you're going to say. You're asking the question as a people pleaser, what can I say or do that will make these people like me the most? But being a God pleaser means saying things that might actually upset the crowd and being willing to say it no matter what the consequences might be. And here we know, and time and time again, we see Paul willing to face the consequences of saying what needed to be said. When the preacher stands up to preach, his number one objective cannot be to say what makes, makes everyone feel warm and cozy. Because the Bible warns there's actually going to come a day that people won't even tolerate the truth about this anymore. Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. He said, for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Paul's word to Timothy is don't cave to the pressure. Instead, Paul says to Timothy, you must preach the word. The call to please God over people gets to the totality of our actions and asks us to evaluate all of our motives. And the good thing about this is, is if my ultimate desire is to please God, then guess what? I can be a good husband if my desire is to please God. I, I can be a good father if my desire utmost and foremost is to please God. I can be a good student if my utmost desire is to please God. I can be a good employee if my utmost desire is to please God. I can do all those things because I do those things as I do them unto Christ. And that's why this sin is so sinister. Because it's not an overt sin. It's not like we walk around with a t-shirt on that says, I'm a people pleaser. It's not something that we, we, we even recognize at times, which is why we need a Holy Spirit hand to help root, root it out. Which is why Paul pointed out this truth. God knows and tests our hearts. You can't hide it. You can't hide from it because God tests our hearts. God, of course, knows our actions. But the amazing thing about our God is that God even knows our motives. He knows why we do what we do. He knows why we say what we say. And we can even do and say the right things for the wrong reasons and God understands the sin therein. And the warning here is that our actions can appear right, but if they're coming from the wrong place, they're still wrong. And just as Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Again, we look at the world today, we say, these are kind of newish issues. We've never had Instagram or TikTok or anything like this before. These are new. We've never had this problem before. But they're still ultimately judged by a simple and yet profound question. And the question is this, are the actions I take driven by an audience of people that I'm seeking to please or driven by something else? That audience that we seek to please, it may be a small audience, it may be your family. You're, you're trying to function in such a way that your parents, that your grandparents, that your family is pleased with you. That audience may be your followers on whatever social network you're, you're plugged into. If I can just post the right content, they will clap and they will heart and they will thumbs up and they will do whatever they're supposed to do that makes me feel validated that I gave them something that they liked. 
as a pastor. The temptation is real for the audience to be the one that's sitting in front of me at this moment. But ultimately and finally, we have to be most concerned with the audience that occupies one single chair, that occupies one who always tests my motives, the one who weighs my actions, the one who knows why I do what I do, and the one who knows why I don't do what I don't do. I can't hide from him. I'm like Adam in the garden. It's always a, one of the oddest stories in the Bible is after Adam and Eve had fallen and they have covered their nakedness with fig leaves and they hear God coming and they try to hide. Uh, the God who saw the moment that the fall happened, the God who was, who was able to discern the reasons that they did what they did, they, they thought that they could hide from that God. Like Adam, I think I may have slid past my creator. He won't catch me this time. But he knows every place that I turn for refuge from his all-knowing gaze. The psalmist perhaps reflected on this truth more than anybody, acknowledging the fact that the creator God knew and the creator God sees, the creator God knows. And I want to tell you today that if your motivation in life is about pleasing all the people that you're required to please, your boss, your spouse, your parents, your teachers, your coaches, whoever that may be, that you are going down a pathway that has a very dark ending. Let me challenge your motives today and encourage you that your number one objective is to live a life that's pleasing to God. And when you do that, you will find that you are a good husband or a good wife. You will find that you are a good mother or a good father. You will find that you are a good brother or a good sister. You will find that you are a good student. You will find that you are a good team player. You will find that you are a good employee if you are seeking first and foremost the kingdom of God, if you're seeking first and foremost to please your creator. Because our God knows our hearts. The psalmist reflected on this, and today I want to close with a psalm as a prayer of invitation. Just to reflect on the truth of what God knows and our inability to hide. Join me in prayer. Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you were there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is his light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, 
My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I would count them. They are more than the sand. I wake and I am still with you. God, we come to you today knowing that we cannot hide. You search our hearts. You see our actions. And God, even today as we've talked about, you see our motives. And so God, I pray that if we are struggling with the sin of being people pleasers, God, that today you will reveal that in our souls and it will be clear to each one of us. God, that the Holy Spirit might reveal that error within us, would call us to repentance, and that, Lord, we would change our motivation for how we go through our life, that our motives would no longer be about pleasing the people around us, that our first and foremost objective would be live lives that are pleasing to a holy God. Lord, I pray that in this moment of invitation, that if there's any here under the sound of my voice, perhaps even their profession of faith as a child or young or young person was motivated not by a desire to please God, but by a desire to please somebody else. That God, that if indeed they have not been walking in true saving faith, God, that today you would call that out and help them to find, to truly find Jesus. God, we pray that you might move in our midst today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.